God, you meet with us uh, often. And uh, you are a God who's very near and living and active. I know there's been uh, several moments amongst us this week where you felt far and you felt silent. And uh, in all that, Lord, we uh, just submit ourselves as a church to you, still expecting to hear from you and longing to be with you. And so, Lord, as we turn to your word, would you uh, move us and stir us uh, in, in our souls? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. My name is Kyle. If you have your Bibles, open to John 8. We're talking about following Jesus. The basic thing that we are doing here at this church, we're a group of committed followers of Jesus. And I've been wanting to just take us through some specific um, passages and uh, concepts that Jesus uh, focuses on in his life and ministry and his teaching. Jesus is teaching his followers concepts, truths. He's teaching you and I uh, things to know uh, that will... Uh, shape our lives. He's not just interested in you knowing concepts, but he's, he's teaching things that will have a dramatic impact upon your life. And so we've been looking at a few of those key things. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, a, a few weeks ago we talked about the image of God and that passage where Jesus says, give to God what is God's. And there he's defining you as a human being as made in the image of God. He's picking up on that biblical theme, but he's not just saying, hey, you're made in the image of God. Sweet, there's the concept for you to learn, but he's, he's wanting it to impact your life that you should give your life to God. The, the, the thought and the, and the doctrine of the image of God, this stuff that we're to know, affects our lives. And that's why Jesus is zeroing in on these key concepts. And last week we talked about grace and forgiveness. He's teaching his people that God is gracious and forgiving. That is the concept he wants you and I to know. But that's not just to know, but it's to actually affect our lives, to be actually people then that receive God's grace and give that, that graciousness to others. And, and, we, and we become a community that's characterized by God's grace and forgiveness. So Jesus is interested in teaching you concepts that are core to your activity. Jesus cares about both. And we'll look this morning at Jesus' use of the Bible as we follow Jesus, he will teach us truth by means of the Bible. That's the, the big point today. In other words, following Jesus means that you will have a deep interaction with the scriptures. As you grow closer to him in your life, over the course of years and over the course of months and hours, he will lead you to have a deep interaction with the scriptures. And that looks a lot of different ways and a lot of different moments and a lot of different seasons in your life. And I want to talk about reading the Bible this morning. It's common knowledge, uh, I think, it's becoming more common knowledge, that the church in America is biblically illiterate. And there have been survey after survey and stat after stat and percentage after percentage that's been going on for the last 40 to 50 years, really since they started caring about stats, uh, talking about how uh, Christians, people who claim to be Christians, don't read their Bible and they don't know their Bible. And I could give you all sorts of stats and it would be alarming. Uh, and uh, you can go and Google those things and you'll get 450 million pages of surveys and results of the stats about how Christians aren't reading their Bible enough. What's true of Red Mountain? What's, what's true of this place? From my experience, uh, we are fairly up and down in our reading of the Bible. As I have interacted with several of you, as I've just engaged my own life in reading the scripture, what I've found is up and down in reading and understanding the Bible. There's many things we don't know. There's many things we still have yet to learn. Uh, and we're still having a hard time uh, being consistent in reading it and interacting with the scriptures. If I were to ask every one of you, I think everybody would say, yeah, we should read that more. I think Red Mountain as a church would say, yes, we should value the scriptures. They're important. We like that they preach from it. Uh, we like that there's classes on it. All those sorts of things. But in our individual moments, our hearts struggle with the word. We genuinely try to make time for it, I think. But that time often gets taken by other things. 
We know we're supposed to have a priority, but actuality in our practice, the priority is not there. So I would say Red Mountain as a whole, if I could speak generalistically and judge you all harshly, uh, myself included, is that we um, come from a place of should be reading the Bible more. We should be reading the Bible more. And so when we come to this passage in John 8, and when we talk about how Jesus wants us to read our Bible, uh, sometimes there can be some shame with that. Uh, And I just want to say right off the bat, this is not deciding if you're a, a Christian or not. What we're talking about in this series is trying to go, grow closer to Jesus. We're trying to follow him more closely. And if you want to follow Jesus more closely, then that's going to bring you to an interaction with the scriptures. That's going to uh, require some time in God's word. And that's what we want to talk about today. I want to establish that point today and help us in that journey. John 8, we're starting verse 30, even though that's the end of the story. Uh, previously, but we'll focus in on verses 31 and 32. It's talking about Jesus. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Jesus has just talked about how he's the light of the world. There's been this dialogue. Many believe in Jesus. And so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him. So he's got this great response. Many believe in him. And he clarifies then, right then, what it means to follow him. He says, if you abide in my word You are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So Jesus, right away, he he is seeking to define what it means to be in discipleship with him, what it means to follow him more closely. Very clearly, he says, you must abide in my word. And so being a disciple of Jesus, being a closer follower of him, means that you've got to abide in his word. Now, what we understand from this is that Jesus' word is not just the red letters in your Bible. It's the Bible. That when we look at the teachings of Jesus, and we'll see this in a moment, when we look at his teachings, when we look at his life, what we see is that God's word has become incarnate. And that everything that Jesus says and does is actually the word of God. And so what Jesus is saying here for us realistically in the 21st century is that if you abide in the scriptures, in the Bible, then you're really Jesus' disciples. And not just as a way of checking it off the list, but he says, abide in my word. He doesn't just say read it or or, uh, listen to it. It is to abide in it. That's a word that just simply means remain, to stay with, to take up residence, to be tethered to it. It's to remain there in Jesus' word, to stay in his word. In other words, we must live in in the world of Jesus' word. To remain and exist in the presence of his teachings. That's what it means to follow Jesus. And why do we do this? You will know the truth. There's a deep hunger for truth in us. And we are seeing that more and more every day. We've talked about that a lot. It can be so hard to figure out truth. And so what Jesus is saying here is, hey, when you interact with me through the scriptures, you'll know the truth. Now, is, Jesus gonna, is the Bible going to tell you every little truth that is involved in your world? No. But the Bible is true in all that it affirms. And, and what Jesus is talking about here is that he is giving you a perspective, a lens by which you view the world. It's like he's giving you a set of of, uh, really cool, awesome, trendy goggles that you view all of life experiences and all the things that are coming at you. You view through the lens of Scripture, of truth. It's like he's saying, if you just view the world according to Scripture. And so the Bible is a fundamental building block for our perspective When we read the Bible, when we interact with the scriptures, when Jesus brings it into our lives, he is shaping your perspective on reality. Now, why would we want this? When Jesus says, you'll know the truth, and what will the truth do? It will set you free. And so the people say, we're offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to everyone, anyone, How is it that you say you will become free? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. So he's not talking about literal slavery of another human owning 
a, a, a human, he's talking about being enslaved to sin. In other words, when you practice sin, what that means is you're enslaved to it. That's the nature of sin. It's enslaving, and you can't escape it on your own. And so it's like Jesus saying, how many of you have sinned to the crowd? And everyone's kind of, yeah, you all are a slave to sin. But if you abide in my word, then you'll know the truth. You will have the proper lens at which you view the world. You'll, you'll have a, a deep understanding of what's going on and who God is and who people are and what your purpose is. And as you have that perspective, it will actually help you break free from enslavement to sin. And so at Red Mountain, we're not just interested in you checklisting and being a good Bible reader and and we're not just talking about, hey, make sure that you read a chapter a day and, and do this sort of things. What we're interested in is meditating on God's word. Why? Because of its tremendous value for all of life, including setting you free from sin. So this is what it means to follow Jesus, and it makes sense because Jesus cares to heal you from sin. How does he do that? He gives you the word. And reading and meditating on the word will set you free from sin. And so as we follow Jesus, he will teach us truth by means of the Bible. He will change our perspective on all of life by means of the scriptures. Jesus gives us a biblical world view. Okay, Kyle, we know this. Again, we're coming from a place of we all know we should read the Bible more. But our desire wanes. It seems like something always tries to intervene. And so for the rest of our time, I want to try and shape that desire. I want to talk about that desire because I think that's really important. We all know we're supposed to read the Bible, but what do we do with that desire struggle? I think God is wanting to shift your mind a little bit. He's wanting to nurture and grow a desire for his word. But it's not just for that alone. It's because of its benefits for you and it's because of its connection with Jesus. And so the desire is worth it. I know it takes a long time to have a desire truly take root in our hearts, and that's what we're engaged in as a church. That's why we talk about a habit of Bible reading, because it's about shaping this desire over the long haul. But what I've noticed in my own heart and in the hearts of a lot of us is we profoundly resist the importance and value of the Scriptures for our lives. We would say they're important, But when it comes down to the hours of the day, something else of higher importance is taking your time. And that's the reality that we need to wrestle with this morning. And so what I want to do to help us in that is just to show you how valuable the scriptures are to Jesus himself. So as we're following him, the idea is that we'll pick up on his values. And one of the values I want to just point out simply today is that he values the scriptures and that he uses them in, his, in the lives of his followers and he uses them to teach us. And so as we follow him, we'll value scripture more and we'll hear it more because that's how Jesus teaches his followers. I just want to take you on a quick tour through the gospel of Matthew and, and show you a number of passages. I could have had up here 60 billion passages of Jesus valuing the word. I just went through the Gospel of Matthew and picked out all the times he specifically quotes the Old Testament. When Jesus was around, that's all they had was the Old Testament. And he uses that thing all the time. All the time. And I want to just show you a couple of those instances. In Matthew 4, if you, if you have your Bible, you can flip through with me in Matthew 4, but you don't have to. Or you can uh, scroll like this. It'll be great. In Matthew 4, he's tempted by the evil one three different ways, and each of those responses is the same type of response. It begins with one key phrase. What is it? It's written. When Jesus was tempted, what did he do? He went to the Word. And he battled Satan face to face, not with his own words, but with words that had already been written down a thousand years before he was even around. Physically, on earth. And so, in Matthew 4, we see that Jesus uses the Bible to fight temptation. Matthew 5, 18. 
Start in verse 17. He says, Do not think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets, which is a way of talking about the Old Testament. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So he's saying that, hey guys, in what's written in the law and prophets, I've come now to fulfill, to bring to fruition, to show you the point, to show you the, the, the things that they're pointing to about the character of God, to put all of that on display. Until heaven and earth pass away, the word is not going to pass away. It is permanent. Jesus valued the scriptures and shows that they all point to him. And not that Jesus then does away with all that, even though some aspects of of the law he's done away with in the sense of fulfilling their purpose. But by no means has the heart of the Old Testament gone away. Matthew 9.13, he is eating with Matthew, a tax collector. And just similar to what we saw last week, There's a lot of people that did not like that Jesus was eating with these types of people and they grumble at him. And so Jesus says this to him in in 9.13. He says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, which is a quotation from from Hosea 6.6, but also other places say it. It's mentioned at least three other times in the Old Testament and probably more uh, that I don't know about because I don't have the Old Testament memorized, believe it or not. But Jesus says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And so what Jesus is doing is literally telling people, go and study your Bibles to figure out what's going on here. He's pointing people to the scriptures. A specific point, a specific verse, but he's telling them, go and figure it out. In Matthew 10, 35, he's warning his followers about how persecution is going to come. Now that's totally unexpected when you think about the Messiah and all that was promised about him and all this kingdom, there's going to be all this healing and and unity and all those sorts of things. But Jesus is saying, now hold on, there's this time period where there's going to be persecution. And he tells them about the book of Micah, specifically chapter 7, verse 6, as he talks about the division that's going to come. In verse 35, For I've come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. In other words, what Jesus is saying here is the nature of what's going to happen in his kingdom has already been talked about. And how we understand the division going on in the Christian people who claim to be Christians and amongst Jesus' followers is we look at it through the lens of Scripture. Yes, God came to unify a group of people, but in the midst of that unity, there's going to be massive division. And some of you have experienced that in your own household. And Jesus gets that from the Old Testament. He uses the current circumstances and says, guys, this is what the Bible has already talked about. This is what God is doing. In Matthew 11, he's talking with John the Baptist. In verses 4, uh, he, it, John the Baptist has sent some of his disciples to ask Jesus if he really is the Messiah. And Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. All of that is from Isaiah 35. And so Jesus is characterizing his mission and his activity in accordance with what the scriptures had already said. And that's his answer to John the Baptist. Of course he's the Messiah. Look at how Isaiah 35 is coming to fruition. And later on in 11 uh, verse 10, he even describes John the Baptist in terms of what the Old Testament said. In other words, as Jesus is answering questions from people, and as he's trying to explain, guys, here's what's going on in this moment. He's using the Bible to do that. Matthew 13, 14, Jesus talked a lot in parables. Again, we looked at one last week. The reason he taught in parables was to fulfill what Isaiah said in, verse, verse, in chapter 6 about how people will not be able to understand. Even though they're going to see the Messiah, they won't understand. Parables are sometimes hard to understand, and they had a way of dividing people because the people that thought, Jesus is crazy, this teaching doesn't make any sense, they left. But the people are like, you know what, he, he might not be crazy. There's something about this story that intrigues me and They would ask more questions. That's how Jesus tested hearts. Who's actually wanting to seek me and who's just wanting to show? Parables did that. And the reason he did that is because Isaiah 6 already talked about it. So Jesus, again, is taking a circumstance and taking aspects of his ministry and doing it in accordance with what the scriptures had already said and telling his disciples that. He values the word. Matthew 22 
Jesus is asked what the greatest commandment is. And Jesus quotes the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, and, and uh, in the, from Leviticus as well. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And, the, and this is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. When Jesus answers these questions, he goes straight to the Bible. Straight to the Bible. In Matthew 26, 31, as he's about to face his arrest, he's just about to be arrested. And he's in the garden. And Matthew 26 picks up the story. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Jesus knew what was about to happen. And he's telling his disciples what's going to happen. And the reason he knew about it is because it had already been talked about. He knew his Bible. And he's saying, guys, you're going to fall away from me. No, we're not. Yes, you are. Zechariah 13 already tells me. You're going to strike the sheep or strike the shepherd and the sheep are going to scatter. So Jesus is understanding the moment. And again, this is the lens. He's viewing what's happening through the lens of Scripture. And it's helping him Jesus, it's helping him know the truth, and and he's trying to point that out to his followers around him. And then the final one to talk about is on Matthew 27, as he is about to die, as he faces the circumstances of his death, as he's brutally hanging on a cross, ashamed before all of the world. How are you supposed to pray in that moment? How are you supposed to view God in that moment? Well, how Jesus handles that moment is he starts praying scripture. That simple prayer, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is from Psalm 22. When Jesus faced the most intense suffering, scripture was his guide. Many more passages we could go to. Uh, The final one is Luke 24. If you have your Bibles, you can flip there. It's a great passage. He's resurrected, and he's appearing to his, his disciples, and this is what he says to them. This is some of the final words in the Gospel of Luke. He says to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Those three phrases, Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms, are a way of talking about the Old Testament, how they're grouped together. And he says, all of those things must be fulfilled. So what's he doing even in his resurrection? He's pointing his followers to the Scriptures, that they're going to be fulfilled. Then there's this great verse, verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And that, I don't think that was just a magical, you now understand everything. I think he taught them. I think he articulated some of these passages and he, and he showed even in his life already, I've been pointing these things out to you as we've gone along. No doubt he went to Isaiah 53. And as you read the rest of the New Testament, we're, we're getting this moment because all of the apostles as they write, they're quoting Old Testament verses and helping us understand the fullness of what God is doing and the plan that, that he has in Jesus And so Jesus is opening his disciples' eyes to the scriptures. What a moment. If there ever was a verse that described my heart for you, it's this one. I pray that Jesus would continually open your eyes to understand the scriptures. And not just so that you can understand them for understanding's sake, but because of how that affects your life. It it helps you so much. It helps you know Jesus. Look what he says. Thus it's written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. He got that. That's in the Bible. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. So he's opening their eyes to the scripture because it helps them have a deeper understanding of who Jesus is and what he came to do. So Jesus is going to open your eyes to the scriptures because it helps you know him more. But not just know him more, it helps you know your purpose in life. That repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed. And you are the witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city 
until you're clothed with power from on high. That's talking about the Holy Spirit, which we'll talk about next week. But here we see Jesus using the scriptures to explain everything, and he's giving his followers the lens. These, this Bible will help you know who Jesus is, and it will help you understand your purpose in life. You have those two truths, you can start filtering everything else through those truths. And that will set you free from being consumed by the cares of this life and being enslaved to the same sins over and over again. Jesus values the scriptures and he uses them to teach us. There have been several examples of this in my life. God has used the scriptures time and time again to teach me, to convict me, to encourage me, to move me. When, I, uh, when Sarah and I had our first child, uh, I did not know uh, that I wasn't going to sleep ever again. No, they didn't, in the manual they give you in the hospital, no one said anything about sleep. And I thought, well, I, I don't, you know, I can survive on seven hours of sleep, that's fine. And then you have a baby and it's like, try surviving on an hour and a half that was interrupted every 10 minutes. Man, I got grumpy. I started resenting and being angry at everybody around me because everybody was in the way of my sacred sleep. I was noticing this huge problem in my soul. What do I do with this, Lord? And searching the Psalms, because honestly, it's desperate, because it was just so, like, life-altering, which is just hard persecution, not sleeping. Man, it was just so hard. But it felt hard in the moment, and God's gracious in that. And I started flipping through the Psalms, and I came across this one. Psalm 63, verse 5. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. Now that caught my attention because when you're tired, when I'm tired, that means I also eat because that gives me energy, specifically ice cream. That has a way of just really giving me energy. So I was like, whoa, my soul will be satisfied as, as with this rich, good food? What, what is he talking about? My soul will be satisfied when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. That convicted me hardcore because I was experiencing the exact opposite. As I was awake in the night, my soul was not satisfied with the Lord. I wasn't even seeking him. All I was doing was just asking him to put this baby to sleep because I don't know how. And that began to change my perspective. Man, what if in the night the Lord's trying to get my attention? What if that's actually the only time that I'll listen to him? And there's other Psalms that started talking about how he instructs your heart in the night and and you're reading, blessed is a man who meditates on the law day and night and try to use these moments where you're just awake because this is a season where the baby is just going to be awake. What if you use that time to meditate on the Lord? Why not take more opportunity to spend time with him? And he began to change my heart and convict me just based upon his word. And that really helped me. I still struggle though. There's still a fight within me. But that, that, that truth is there that I can speak to myself and, and command my soul to make the change that I know I need to make. And I can utilize scripture to make that change. When Sarah and I first met, we started dating. I was scared that I was going to screw it up. She was such an amazing girl. And I was like, man, I've made a mess of past dating relationships. And all my friends, I was a college kid. And all my friends around me, everybody was making mess of dating. I was like, how do we date? No one knows how to date well. It's such a terrible thing. And so people were inventing all these new things and Man, America's got this dating thing that's all gone wrong and we should go back to courtship or arranged marriages or whatever. Uh, and yet here I was dating Sarah, this amazing woman, and how was I going to do this well to where we didn't end, if the relationship ended, it wouldn't be painful. We wouldn't have years to, of damage to undo. And just struggling with that. And I was reading the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 4, Um, 23 simply says this, guard your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of life. And that phrase, the Lord just stuck to me. Guard your heart and guard Sarah's heart. If you approach this dating relationship, I remember talking with Sarah and just talking about how this needs to be our philosophy of dating. We actually talked about it. We gotta guard each other's hearts. That's how we can do this well. It's not just about pushing the envelope of physical intimacy or emotional intimacy or spiritual. How, how far can we get and all those sorts of things. Instead, it became about guarding hearts. 
and making sure that we're shepherding each other along the way and making sure that if this relationship ends, her heart isn't going to be totally damaged and, and gone for a year while she has to pick up the pieces of how I've wounded her and vice versa. And see, this passage in Proverbs 4 really helped me figure out how to date well. See, God gives us wisdom. He wants to teach us through the scriptures. And there's many other stories I could give, many other stories I'm sure you have. But Jesus values the Bible. He spoke from it all the time, and he consistently points his people to the scriptures. He teaches us by means of the Bible. He helps us with truth and perspective. And these truths will set us free from sin. They will help us understand who Jesus is, why he died, and why he rose again. It will help us understand our purpose and mission in life. And so if you're not interacting with the scriptures, you're not going to feel as close to Jesus as you'd like. And not just reading them, but interacting them, because a lot of the world can't even read, but there's a way of interacting with the scriptures, and there's a way God invades the scriptures and gets them to his people. It's all kinds of missionaries and, and, and a number of great organizations working to translate pieces of the Bible into the language, and God is moving that. Because if we're, we're not interacting with the Scriptures, you're not going to know Jesus that well. You're not going to know your purpose. You're not going to be able to even defeat sin. And so we want to follow Jesus. Uh, as a group, we want to follow Jesus. Let me just give four quick things of the implications of this. Since Jesus values the scriptures so much, and since uh, he takes his followers to scripture, let me just give four things of, of things that we must do. First, we must read and meditate on the Bible. That's a very simple application, but that is as simple as it gets. If Jesus is teaching you and I truth through the scriptures, what should we do? Well, we should read it and meditate on it. And again, not just uh, read to accomplish a checklist, even though some days it will feel like that. That's okay. The point is not to get something inspirational out of it every day. The point is to read and meditate on it. Sometimes when you read the Bible, all you're going to have is questions. That's great meditation. Sometimes God will bring you to a confusing passage because that's what it takes to get you to meditate on something because you're trying to resolve it. I don't understand this. And when we don't understand something, that tension breeds meditation. That's just what it does. And he knows that about humans. So he makes things that are a little bit confusing and hard for us to understand at first. It's okay. Meditate on it. Make the change from being a checklist reader to to a meditative reader. Second, Cultivate a desire by the long-term habit. This desire to read the scriptures is slow forming. Slow. There are many days where you and I will wake up and we just do not want to read the Bible at all. And we're sitting there reading it. And our mind is elsewhere because we just hate it. We're like, oh, this is so boring. Or whatever it is. We just can't focus our minds on it. The solution to that is not to find some inspirational devotional the solution is to engage the long-term habit there's this great passage in deuteronomy 31 listen to this moses wrote the law and he gave it to the priests the sons of levi who carried the ark of the covenant of yahweh and he gave it to all the elders of israel and moses commanded them and says at the end of every seven years at the set time in the year of release at the feast of booths when all israel comes to appear before the lord You shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble all the people, the men, the women, the little ones, and the sojourner within your towns, that they all may hear and learn to fear Yahweh your God and be careful to do all the words of this law, and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear Yahweh your God as long as you live in the land that you're going over to the Jordan to possess. In other words, And there's no record of this actually happening, but what God set up is that every seven years, everybody was supposed to gather in Jerusalem at a particular feast, and they would read the law out loud so that everybody who could hear it, and all the new kids that had been born, and all the people that had come in the land, everybody could hear it and be on the same page. It's like a restart, a refresh. And it was a rhythm every seven years, a habit to cultivate a desire to fear the Lord. 
and to be experiencing the blessing of following him. And so there's something to be said about a long-term habit. This is a heart behind uh, starting in, in the beginning of 20, 2022, what we want to do as a church, just in light of, of these concepts here where Jesus cares about us having a biblical worldview, is we want to read through the Bible together. We want to just take 2022 as this first refresh. And we want to try to do it every seven years where as a church we stop everything that we're doing and we just read the Bible through together. And we'll have reading plans for you. We'll, we'll have some resources uh, available to help you with that, but I would encourage you to start thinking about how you're going to join in with that process and join us as a church. All the ministries will be participating to various capacities and levels, and we'll have small groups and those sorts of things, ways of interacting and asking questions, but that's what we want to do, and our hope is to try and do it every seven years, to follow this habit, so we all come together, get a restart, be refreshed in what the Bible says and what this story is about. It'll be a great time. Uh, that's going to start January 1st, by the way. Uh, so gird up the loins of your mind. Third, <clears throat> we must use them correctly. The Bible is not just meant to be read. We're not just talking about reading it, but we have to handle the Word of God rightly. There's so much damage that can be done when we're not reading it rightly. And that happens as we are in community. That's why you need Community is so to make sure that we're handling the Word of God appropriately and rightly. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.16 talks about how the Scriptures are useful. They have a use for rebuking and training and correcting. So we've got to use them correctly. And then fourth, allow the Bible to shape our perspective. In life, you face confusing times, hard moments, Moments that will cause you to just be in so much tension. It's in these moments that we turn to the Word and allow it to shape your perspective on the events that are happening. It's always good to have a person or a group of people in your life that will turn your eyes to the Word in those moments. We need to allow the Bible to shape our perspective. We want to spend some time in worship together. Jess and the team are going to lead us in a couple of songs that try to put um, some prayers in our minds about what we've just talked about as we've wrestled through the desire or lack thereof and the importance that this is to Jesus. So let me pray and then let's uh, sing and pray together in this time of response. God, we ask that you meet with us now. Continue to speak to us about the desires of our hearts and how you Love us and you desire for us to follow you more closely. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.